angry, terrified, mourning, shock. The city of Nashville and the nation coming to terms with the heartbreaking news of another mass school shooting. Rifle first, rifle first, blue, go, 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 go. Move, move. I'm with you. In the days following the tragedy, investigators are piecing together what happened and what led up to the massacre. Kids are all locked down, but we have two kids that we don't know where they are. Okay. Among the six victims, three nine-year-old students, Evelyn Dykehouse, Hallie Scruggs, and William Kinney. 60-year-old Katherine Kuntz was also shot and killed, as well as 61-year-old Cynthia Peake and Mike Hill. Let's go! Metro Police! We now know the shooter is identified as 28-year-old Audrey Elizabeth Hale. Initially, investigators announced the mass shooter as a woman who is now being classified as a transgender man. Born a female, Hale's LinkedIn profile noted the use of he, him pronouns. Other social media indicated Hale went by the name Aiden rather than Audrey. Hale was shot and killed by police during the attack. It's upstairs. It sounds like it's upstairs. At about 10.13 a.m. on March 27th, the first call came in for the shooting at the Covenant School Nashville Private Christian School. Security camera video released by the Metropolitan Nashville Police Department shows the shooter arrive at the school at about 9.53 a.m. Minutes later, at 9.57 a.m., the shooter sends some messages to Averiana Patton, a former basketball teammate. Patton says she had not kept in contact with the shooter since they played together back in middle school. The shooter's messages read in part, quote, You'll probably hear about me on the news after I die. This is my last goodbye. And, one day this will make more sense. I've left behind more than enough evidence behind, but something bad is about to happen. At 10.10 a.m., the shooter opens fire at the school, shattering glass on a set of double doors. After that, Hill crawls through the openings and enters the school. Multiple angles of security footage show the shooter walking around the school, pointing their weapon. Investigators say Hale was armed with two rifles, a handgun, and significant ammunition. Go. Less than 15 minutes later, at 10.13 a.m., the shooter was killed when officers Michael Colazzo and Rex Engelbert opened fire. Go, 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 go. A later search of the shooter's vehicle led to the discovery of a manifesto. Police also say Hill created detailed maps of the school highlighting possible entry points. Nashville officials say the shooter also conducted surveillance on the school before the shooting. They've since confirmed Hale was once a student at the school. Somehow school shootings, not always, but often somebody had an experience at that school. They went to that school, they had worked at that school, they had a relative. So when you often when you hear school shootings, you think there's some connection. It's such a emotionally charged time in people's lives. I mean, forget shootings, just in general. People have such emotionally charged reactions to school and history and frustration and growth and learning and all those things. And so I, I, I'm not surprised that this person had a connection to the school. Dr. Jonathan Metzel, the director of the Department of Medicine, Health and Society at Vanderbilt University, was only about 15 minutes away from the shooting when it unfolded. It's literally just right up the street from us and many of the victims were brought to our hospital here yesterday. An expert on mass shootings, Metzl was working on his own book about the gruesome topic when news broke of the Covenant School shooting. He says it hits too close to home. Even though I study this and I feel like I'm in some ways an expert in it, it doesn't really prepare you in a way for just the emotional response of what a day like yesterday feels like. A lot of our colleagues live in that area, had sent their kids to that school or schools nearby, and really Parents are having a hard time dropping their kids off at school this morning. They don't know what to say to their kids. People are afraid just going to the grocery store or getting, somebody told me they didn't fill up their car this morning with gas because they didn't know if it was safe to go to the gas station. So the level of just fear about everyday interactions, this is 
kind of how terrorism works when you think about it. People feel ter terrified in places that should be safe in their, in their everyday life. But this shooting proved somewhat unique compared to others Metzl has researched, in that school children were among the victims. We've had multiple, multiple victim homicides already this year. Um, kids getting shot, uh, but, but there's something about a gun person entering a school and killing nine-year-olds that just is, is almost another level of fear. Metzl says mass shootings, like any form of terrorism, are unpredictable. This is somebody who nobody had really heard of before yesterday, and so you're really grasping at any kind of expression because it's such a human need to think, like, why would somebody kill innocent people? We want we want to understand that, and and so I think any kind of utterance or expression, uh, writings, artwork by that person is going to give us insight into that. But I also think I I can tell you from studying this for a long time that it's just never enough. Like we never get the full answer of why somebody would do this. Uh, stressor in that person's life. Forensic psychologist Dr. John Delatory says the shooter may have felt violence was the only answer. Only way to do so is to get this message that they, whatever that is, usually you find it in screeds and manifestos and stuff like that, but get this message across. And the only way to do that is to make some kind of demonstration. And typically it's violence and violence against a workplace, violence against a school, violence against families. Violent, just violence is the only way that they believe people will listen to what they have to say. While a manifesto could provide some answers, Metzl says not everything about the tragedy can be explained. Manifestos often give us an insight into their own psychopathology a lot of times. Um, but then, of course, those manifestos are not free of the politics of race and gender and guns in America. And so then they're interpreted through, through those lenses. But that doesn't mean some aren't searching for answers. After the shooter's identity was revealed, information from Hale's social media pages circulated online, showing a passion for art. Some pointed out that the shooter had previously created children's artwork, but also darker images, like that of Jack Torrance from The Shining. But according to Delatori, the shooter's artwork isn't necessarily a red flag. And we can't read too much into what they were doing, but we can certainly look at the style in which it's being done, you know, how forceful the, the lines, you know, that are being drawn are, you know, the sort of content of it, we can absolutely kind of take a look at what might this person have been experiencing? What is going on in the world around them that may have triggered wanting to do this piece of art? You know, there, a, a lot of the inner turmoil that a person would be experiencing has to come out somewhere. It has to come out somehow and usually through the art. And so we can absolutely see sort of the progression of what the person was experiencing through the art that was being demonstrated. Many questions still remain about the shooter's gender identity and whether being a trans man could have led to the mass shooting. This individual might have seen that certain laws were being put in place that further disenfranchised this individual and individuals like this person. So instead, they chose a target that was seemingly symbolic of the laws and policies and cultural zeitgeist and other kinds of things that they felt comfortable, quote unquote, comfortable using that as a target because they knew it. But it may actually symbolize a larger issue at play. Just weeks ago, Tennessee's governor signed a bill into law banning gender affirming care for minors and drag shows in public or in front of children. I think that the danger is going to be of this shooting happening at this time, that it ties into, it's just a very charged moment right now for gender and trans issues in Tennessee. We have a lot of anti-drag show legislation and anti-gender affirming care legislation. It's just a really charged moment. And so the confluence of all these things, I mean, it's probably not happenstance that it happened now. I have no idea, but I would say that just, you just couldn't, pick a more volatile mix of things. Metzl says the idea of a trans mass shooter could lead into negative stereotypes, like the fictional Buffalo Bill character in The Silence of the Lambs. But according to his research, there is little data on trans mass killers. I certainly think as an aggregate group, there, I, have, I don't have any data right now, but I would say there are probably many more heterosexual mass shooters. I, I don't think that people who are trans are more risky than anybody else 
committing mass shootings. Um, but but I think again, the issue of that issue linked to this shooting is certainly something we should look at very very directly because I think we want to know what what happened and how can how can we prevent this. Delatory says people who don't conform to traditional standards could incorrectly be seen as more harmful. Individuals who seem to deviate from what is consider considered to be traditional uh, roles, traditional outlooks, traditional whatever, any individual that deviates from that is otherized, right? So they're, they're always going to be viewed as much more dangerous than what they actually are much more uh, gaslighting, much more manipulative, much more coercive. They're much more negative than the reality of the situation. He says it's possible the shooter's gender identity may not have played that large of a role in the shooting. Regardless of biological sex, regardless of gender identity, individuals who are willing to commit these kinds of mass violence are often disenfranchised, often feel isolated, are often disconnected from other people. They often feel as though life is terrible and, and the world is a dangerous place. And so it starts with an internal sort of disgust. They, they, they don't like who they are and they're willing to engage in self-harm behaviors or at least willing to consider engaging in self-harm behaviors. But for whatever reason, that stops and it externalizes. It, it, it turns away from the person feeling uh, that the world is out to get them and, and more to the feeling that they need to set right a world that has gone wrong around them. The reason behind the mass shooting can vary greatly on a case-by-case -case basis. Each individual has this sort of reasoning behind and rationale behind why they think what they're going to do, number one, is going to work. And number two is the sort of actual valid reason to engage in this behavior. That's individualized. But there is a pathway to violence that includes societal pressures, internal turmoil, individuals who are not able to cope with the negative aspects of living life, grievance gathering, right? So individuals who are unwilling to kind of let go of even the smallest perceived slice. For Metzl, the shooting hits too close to home, both in his line of study and location. He says such a polarizing topic should be treated delicately. So I just had a colleague and, and her 10 year old daughter said, is it safe for me to go to school? And she said, I hope so, but I don't know. Let's, let's talk about it. She wasn't trying to like fake it. And, and I thought that was an, a nice approach to say, look, there are scary people out there and we do the best we can to, to protect you. But I just think there's a level of honesty between parents and children right now that is super important because the scariest thing is we don't have the answers and and grown-ups are doing their best. Nobody wants this to happen on on any side, but it's just it's a moment to just keep talking and keep processing and showing lots of love and support. Right now, officials are still in the early stages of the investigation. Long Crime Network will continue to follow all the developments in the Nashville mass school shooting and bring you the latest developments as they unfold. Reporting for Long Crime Network, I'm Sierra Gillespie.